Well, first of all, I would like to thank you all for being there. Uh, and I'm very thankful for the invitation to share our work here today and also to know more about how Eurobioimaging works. Uh, we are working um, to understand viral infections in cells, and our main goal is to identify new targets for uh, antiviral treatments. Uh, it is true that we have really very few antivirals. Um, during these years of pandemic, people ask all the time why we have so few antivirals. The thing is that to develop an efficient and safe antiviral, we really need to know the virus very well. SARS-CoV-2 is a new virus. It's true that we have been uh, studying this virus uh, very intensely all over the world, but we are still to know more about this and other pathogenic viruses in order to have good antivirals. And this is the hope that there are many laboratories working now on this topic, and hopefully we will have a battery of good antivirals for the pathogenic viruses that we have now and those to come. So in our lab, in the Cell Structure Lab at the National Center for Biotechnology, this is one of the institutes of the Spanish National Research Council, we are working on the cell biology of viral infections. We are working with uh, a number of human pathogens, but uh, lately mainly on Bunia viruses, uh, real viruses. And since seven years ago, we have been working uh, to identify new antivirals, since two years ago, we have been also studying antivirals to combat SARS-CoV-2. We use a variety of imaging methods from live cell imaging and confocal microscopy, super resolution light microscopy. We also uh, found a very useful correlative microscopy, correlative light and electron microscopy, and we are electron microscopists. Actually, is what we are experts on is uh, uh, electron microscopy in two and three dimensions. So for those uh, curious about what we do, here you have our website on the bottom of the page. So you can see the fundamentals of the methods we use and, and the different projects, the applications. And in the last uh, few years, we have been identified a number of pathways and processes that uh, viruses develop inside the infected cells. For example, for Bunia viruses, we have identified uh, viral factories. These are uh, structures that do not exist in an infected cell. And the virus builds these uh, factories to replicate the genome and also to uh, assemble new viral particles and, and transform them into uh, infectious particles. So for the Bunia viruses, they make a very complex factory made of Golgi, ER, and mitochondria, and the Golgi is actually the, the main element. We have characterized different aspects of the function of these factories. For influenza virus, we identified a new organelle, a new coated vesicle that the virus assembles to transport the viral ribonucleoproteins, the genome of the virus from the nucleus where replication takes place to the surface of the plasma, to the plasma membrane for virus secrets. For rheoviruses, we identified a peculiar pathway of uh, endoplasmic reticulum remodeling uh, done by two rheovirus proteins. Uh, these proteins elongate and, and fragment the ER, and they transform the ER into a meswork of membranes that they become the replication organelles of the virus. And we also identified a new pathway of virus secret done by the uh, rheovirus. They uh, kidnap the, uh, and transform the lysosomes of the cell, and they transform them into uh, elements, transport elements that uh, select only mature viruses on the uh, periphery of the viral factory and then bring them to the cell surface. So um, if we want to um, understand uh, how the virus infects the cell to identify new antivirals, well, I would like first to first uh, to show how we, we do this project. No? What is an antiviral? An antiviral interferes with a step of the virus life cycle. And basically we have two types. We have direct acting antivirals that target a specific component of the virus. They are very specific, normally very efficient. They, uh, well, the problem is that the viruses mutate, they change and variants might escape because they are very specific for viral components. Then we have drugs against cell targets. Uh, viruses use cell pathways. They are um, intracellular parasites. And uh, it's interesting also when we know more about different viruses that they can use common um, cell pathways. Actually, many medicines that we, we take uh, uh, are 
uh, inhibitors or target cell pathways. In this particular case, variants should not escape, but we have the problem of the secondary effects. The trick is to keep the secondary effects under um, control conditions, let's say. Uh, a very interesting concept or a strategy that has been uh, taken by many labs and pharmaceutical companies is drug reporting. This means that we have a long list of medicines that have been uh, validated and approved for the use in humans to treat other diseases. And then we can try to look for these inhibitors of cell pathways that could be also used to attack viruses. So this is what we call drug repurposing that should accelerate the uh, identification and the validation of an antiviral. Then we apply a very strict criteria of selection, such as the novelty, the availability, uh, obviously we need molecules that can be uh, produced at a reasonable cost and, and they can be produced in large amounts. And also we look for information about where these compounds, if this information is available, where they concentrate within the body to know if they are uh, going to be useful for those uh, organelles, or, so uh, for those organs where the viruses uh, make the, the infection. No? And then we do another thing once we have a list of components that uh, can be useful, molecular modeling. I mean, we collaborate with experts in computational chemistry and they also can uh, somehow uh, study if our candidates are very good, uh, are potential inhibitors because of their uh, properties of interaction with the, with the target that we want to, to attack. So when we have a list of compounds, we do studies in vitro and cell culture. If they uh, are successful, we need to go to animal models. And if the results are positive, then the clinical trials in phase one, two, three, after authorization is what we call phase four. Uh, the compounds are studied after uh, commercialization and, and authorization because during years we can know more about these uh, compounds and if they are, if there is a need to modify how the treatments are done. So at the present, uh, the World Health Organization have a list of priority diseases. They update this uh, list uh, over time. And we have these diseases caused by viruses. Three of them that I color in blue are coronaviruses. It's the SARS coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, and the MERS. And three of them are Bunia viruses. I uh, color here in purple, the Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus, Lassa fever virus, and Rift Valley fever virus. So the Bunia viruses are a very important group of pathogens. I will talk about, about these viruses. And in my talk, I'm going to talk about the search for new antivirals to combat Bunia viruses because we have none. And search for new antivirals uh, to combat SARS-CoV-2. And I will just uh, say a little bit about our morphological studies on plepidepsin. This is an antiviral uh, commercialized with the name of aplidin that is now in clinical trials to treat COVID-19. It's an antiviral against uh, SARS-CoV-2. So Bunia viruses is a large order of RNA viruses with more than 380 viruses. They are arboviruses transmitted by arthropods, and Marie already told us today how uh, relevant are these viruses, arboviruses, for human health. And most of them are transmitted by uh, arthropods such as sand flies, ticks, or mosquitoes. A small group within the Bunia virales order is transmitted by rodents, but most of them are arboviruses. Apart from dengue, chikungunya, and Zika, that uh, you have heard of these viruses, these viruses here, uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus, Rift Valley fever virus, the Dabibanda virus, and the Smallenberg that affects livestock and has been a, a big problem in Europe, these are Bunia viruses. Bunia viruses are uh, envelope viruses. The envelope comes from the Golgi complex where the virus establishes the factory and makes all the functions. In this envelope, we have two glycoproteins that bind to the receptors on the surface of cells. And inside we have three molecules, three viral ribonucleoproteins of RNA of negative polarity that contain the nucleocapsid and the polymerase. And this is how they look like by negative staining in transmission electron microscopy. The diameter of the particles is around 100 nanometers. So some years ago, we realized that Bunia viruses assemble factories. Many RNA and DNA viruses assemble factories, this we know now. Uh, 
This is the factory of Bunyan Vera virus. This is the prototype of the Bunyan viral disorder and it's made, uh, it's uh, built using the Golgi complex here colored in, in red. If we look at this by electron microscopy, we can see replication organelles. These are uh, single membrane spherules uh, made by uh, components of the virus and components of the cell. Here we can see that over time, these spherules grow a cylinder and inside the cylinder, the virus storage the uh, viral ribonuclear proteins. And we can see also viral particles in, in the Golgi uh, membranes. So there are uh, three types of particles uh, during the life cycle. First, we have the immature particle. It's assembled on the this side of the Golgi. It's non-infectious. When the virus moves to the trans side, the uh, changes in the glycosylation of the glycoproteins of the envelope transforms the virus in a partly infectious virus. And after egress, the virus uh, assembles the mature spikes and these particles are fully infectious. So looking for um, inhibitors of these viruses, we have uh, started with two strategies, direct acting antivirals against viral components and antivirals or compounds against cell components, cell factors used by the virus. I'm going to show the example of one of the direct acting antivirals this has been done, uh, the identification of the list of potential compounds has been done by Jose Pedro Ceron. Uh, he's a collaborator uh, of us uh, at the University uh, of Cartagena in Spain. And uh, he's uh, an expert in computational chemistry. So he was looking for molecules similar to the PBA. This molecule is an inhibitor of influenza virus and an inhibitor of the endonuclease uh, domain of the RNA polymerase. This polymerase is similar to the polymerase of the Bunia virus, and what he looked, uh, he looked for molecules, and he identified a list of compounds. Fifteen were selected because of their best scores. We uh, tested uh, after a strict selection a number of them. Uh, four did not work, but one of them was a success. And this is the kind of uh, techniques or results that we obtained. We do immunofluorescence with an anti antibody against the nucleocapsid protein of the virus that is uh, synthesized in large amounts early in infection. And with increasing concentrations of the compound, we can see that at the end we have uh, inhibition, full inhibition of infection. Of course, this has to be done at concentrations that are safe, that are non-toxic for the cell. So we do first uh, a test of uh, toxicity and we can see that the infection goes down to zero uh, with these concentrations that are still safe. We can see also that the viral proteins, the synthesis is uh, significantly reduced. Electron microscopy uh, told us very interesting details about how this compound uh, is working in Bunia virus infected cells. Here we have the Golgi of an infected cells without the antiviral. So we see the replication organelles, viral particles, but in the cells that were infected and treated with this antiviral, we see a major modification of the Golgi complex. Curiously, we are targeting a viral uh, compound, the viral polymerase, but the viral polymerase in a, is in a structural uh, uh, factor or one of the components that builds the replication organelles, the spherules. And when we target, when we eliminate its function, its a structural role is also impaired. So we see no uh, replication organelles, we don't see spherules. And the few viral structures that we are able to see are not normal. So we are working now to uh, transfer these uh, experiments into in vivo studies. To, uh, there is a model of Rhee Valley fever virus in mice. We would like to know if this compound is uh, as promising in vivo as in vitro, because it's a big jump for this. But sometimes things are not black and white. like. Uh, with the compound I just uh, described. Sometimes in the presence of the antiviral, the virus wins. And uh, this happens with uh, some of the compounds we have been working with. For this, correlative light and electron microscopy is a big help. So these experiments are done as it is described here. We infect viruses, uh, we infect cells with the green virus, the GFP virus, and then we do two things. Cell sorting to separate fluorescent infected uh, from non-fluorescent, non-infected cells. And then we do proteomics, transcriptomics, and lipidomics to know what's going on when the virus wins and when the antiviral wins. And for uh, imaging, we can select those cells where the, uh, the virus uh, is winning, is infecting in the presence of the antiviral. 
And here we have an example with rivavirin. Rivavirin is an inhibitor of RNA polymerases used as an antiviral for different viruses. When we don't have the compound, the rivavirin, the spherules are normal. They have a dense uh, content with ribonucleoproteins inside. But in those cells that we still have infection, the virus gets to assemble the spherules, but they are probably work very slow because we said that they are not structurally uh, normal and their content is rather empty. So what we are doing uh, in this project is testing more direct acting antivirals. We are targeting uh, cell components. Uh, in this proteomics study, we have identified a number of uh, mitochondrial proteins that are important for the viral infection, and we are trying to target them to uh, obtain inhibitors of cell factors as a, a different strategy against Bunia viruses. So I'm going to switch now to coronaviruses. Uh, these are envelope viruses with uh, uh, spikes that are very neat, as we can see in negative staining as this uh, very neat uh, corona of spikes. Uh, we have glycoproteins and a large ribonucleoprotein inside RNA of positive polarity. So the antivirals to combat SARS-CoV-2, uh, there are three that are authorized, remdesivir uh, and molnupiravir are inhibitors of RNA polymerase. Nirmatrelvir is an inhibitor of the M-protease, and they have shown clinical benefits when administered early infection. This is because, as we know, COVID-19 has three stages. The first one, where the virus starts to replicate and invade the organism. Then a second one, the pulmonary phase, and then the hyperinflammation. If we go to hyperinflammation, uh, the antivirals have nothing to do. Really, it's, it's too late. So uh, the antivirals have to be administered uh, at the beginning. And several antivirals are currently in clinical trials for uh, COVID-19. So as we can see here in this uh, nice cartoon from the animation lab at the University of Utah, these are the uh, general uh, phases of SARS-CoV-2 infection, the entry with uh, two different mechanisms. But once inside, the virus controls uh, the cell and transform the rough endoplasmic reticulum to build double membrane uh, vesicles that form together a replication organelle of the virus. And then the components of the virus needs to migrate to the Golgi and uh, RG, and then uh, exit the cell by uh, constitutive secretion. Uh, well, in our case, what we did was to elaborate a library of compounds based on previous, uh, on previous projects. Uh, all these compounds come from drug repurposing. They are inhibitors of cell factors. And we knew that could be inhibitors of, in general, of RNA viruses and hopefully of SARS-CoV-2. I mean, this is a different strategy. We have the high throughput that is very important. People are testing thousands of compounds to identify inhibitors. And the other compound is to, uh, the other strategy is to uh, use previous knowledge about what could be uh, inhibited in cells to target these viruses. So Jose Pedro Ceron, our collaborator, confronted this library in silico by molecular modeling, not only to the cell targets that we know that these uh, molecules are attacking, but also to the uh, vital proteins of SARS-CoV-2. And curiously, curiously, he found several molecules that also could be potential inhibitors of the viral proteins. Well, some of them are small molecules that could fit in active sites of different proteins. So maybe this is because, uh, because of this, this happened. No? So this library, we tried uh, first with a different coronavirus, not with SARS-CoV-2 directly, but with this uh, common cold coronavirus, the 229E, this virus can be handled under BSL-2 conditions. And since at the beginning of the pandemic, the use of the BSL-3 was complicated because there were many labs trying to, to do research with SARS-CoV-2, we decided to start the projects right away. And also because we thought if, uh, that we would like to find inhibitors for coronaviruses in general, not only for SARS-CoV-2. So this is, again, the strategy we detect by immunofluorescence at increasing concentration of the compound, non-toxic concentrations, until we find total inhibition. And this is the kind of graphs, again, that we find. When the compound is good, uh, we have no toxicity but total inhibition. But sometimes we have these cases that there is no toxicity but no inhibition. And then uh, a number of the compounds that inhibited the coronavirus of common cold were tested to, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. 
We also tested compounds that did not inhibit the 229E uh, coronavirus, but that because of the in silico results were very promising for SARS-CoV-2, we, we brought them to the assays with SARS-CoV-2. And with, uh, well, this collection, uh, we found four compounds that were efficient inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2, uh, as we can see here, and non-toxic conditions, and they were efficient with different variants of SARS-CoV-2, including Omicron, is not shown here, but they also inhibit Omicron. And this is what electron microscopy told us about the, what the compounds were doing. No? We have uh, the infection of SARS-CoV-2 in vero E6 cells without any antiviral. We see the replication organelle, the double membrane vesicles, and then viruses in vesicles, in single membrane vesicles, and uh, vacuoles and extracellular viruses. If somebody is curious about how this big organelle, replication organelle, looks like in three dimensions, please go to this very nice work of the group of Monse Bartena in the Netherlands. They did cryo electron tomography and they could see how these double membrane vesicles are organized and connect to, the, to each other in three dimensions. Here in green, we have filaments that is the, the viral ribonucleoproteins of the virus. So uh, different compounds did uh, different things to the virus. And this was also dose dependent. We uh, tried different doses, uh, concentrations of the compounds. For example, this one, this compound at low dose, Almost, uh, we don't see alteration of the double membrane vesicles. They are quite normal, but the viruses look empty. They are not well assembled. And at high dose, we find a total uh, disruption of the double membrane vesicles of the replication organelle. And viruses are very few, and they are trapped between the membranes of the double membrane vesicles. These two compounds do different things. For example, the number 22, the double membrane vesicles are not able to assemble and viruses we see very few and they look disrupted. And this one, the number 33, that is uh, so far the most promising, the DMVs, the replication organelle is altered. And curiously, the viruses are formed, but they are trapped in large vacuoles that look like a degradation compartments. This is the summary of what we found. Uh, we have started 116 compounds. 46 uh, were tested in the common cold coronavirus and 27 of them inhibited this virus. Then uh, we discarded 10 because of lack of novelty during our study, they were published as inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2 and 17 were tested with SARS-CoV-2. Four of them uh, inhibited the virus and one of them is now being uh, tested in in vivo experiments in the hamster model. In the last part of, uh, of my talk, I would like to just to show uh, a few details about our work with blitidepsin. This is an antiviral that is currently in clinical trials, has been commercialized with the name of aplidin. So uh, aplidin, uh, blitidepsin, was identified by the pharmaceutical company PharmaMar in this uh, marine uh, organism, aplidium albicans, and it's an anti-tumor agent that uh, was demonstrated is an inhibitor of the eukaryotic translation elongation factor one. So this molecule inhibits a key factor of the cell. It's a very abundant factor in the cell, uh, only uh, less abundant than um, that actin. So it's really very abundant and it's a key factor for protein synthesis. So in um, a summary of what we know about plitidepsin in 2018, the Australian government approved the use of uh, plitidepsin and dexamethasone to treat some kind of myeloma. And curiously, at the beginning of the pandemic of SARS-CoV-2, uh, well, some scientists did a, a screening trying to uh, identify cellular proteins that interact with SARS-CoV-2 components, and they identified this elongation uh, factor that, well, interestingly, we already had an inhibitor, plitidepsin. So um, different laboratories work with the pharmaceutical company to study in vitro and in animal models uh, this compound and gave promising results. And the results of the phase one clinical trial has been published and currently the uh, phase three clinical trial is ongoing. Uh, well, uh, where plitidepsin could be acting? Well, the obvious thing to think is that it was blocking the synthesis of viral proteins because it blocks a, a factor of the cell that is important for protein synthesis. So independently of the mechanism of entry of SARS-CoV-2 in cells, 
This is what we have so far, as I mentioned before, remdesivir, molnupiravir, and irmatrelvir have been approved and they are inhibitors of the replication of the virus. Plitidepsin was placed here, uh, theoretically, uh, that it could be inhibiting the synthesis of proteins and then blocking viral morphogenesis. So we were doing studies uh, in collaboration with Dr. Nuria Izquierdo Uceros uh, at the IRSI Caixa in Barcelona. With her, we have done all the uh, studies with SARS-CoV-2. And the, uh, we could see that plitidepsin interferes uh, with the replication of all the different variants, including Omicron of SARS-CoV-2. And when we did electron microscopy, what we found is uh, the following. This is, again, cells infected without any antiviral. So we have the replication organelle, the DMBs, extracellular viruses, intracellular viruses. But when we add plitidepsin, there is absolutely nothing. The blockade is total. We have no DMBs, we have no viral particles. This happened at different doses of the drug, even at uh, 50 nanomolar, that is quite uh, low. We saw that the normal replication organelle and viral particles uh, disappear. There is no uh, replication of the virus. We also did immunogold. We detected uh, components of the virus, for example, uh, the nucleocapsid protein by immunogold with primary antibodies and secondary antibodies with colloidal gold particles. Here we see the strong signals of the SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid. And with plitidepsin, uh, nothing at all. This also happened with other components such as the double-stranded RNA is an intermediate of the viral replication process. So now we can place plitidepsin also here, and no doubt that there is no viral morphogenesis, but also because plitidepsin is another inhibitor of the replication process because it blocks the assembly of the replication organelle of the virus. The good news is that um, some other pathogenic viruses use this elongation factor uh, in particular, uh, this uh, elongation factor has been identified as a component of complexes with the viral polymerase of other viruses in the replication organelles, for example, HIV, West Nile, papilloma. So we have hope uh, to, to be uh, handling one of the very uh, necessary broad spectrum antivirals to, to attack different viruses and to combat uh, potential outbreaks in the future. So what we do now in collaboration with uh, our, co or our other labs is to test lower concentrations and uh, recovery assays. That means to remove the drug and see what happens. Is the virus dead or is able to come back? And we do this with a number of techniques, including proteomics and imaging. So I would like to just to finish this. We are electron microscopists, so we like uh, EM a lot. And uh, I, I hope I have shown some examples that demonstrate that EM can tell us important details about how antivirals work in cells and, and sometimes when they fail, what's going on in cells. And this is the team uh, working in these projects. The Cell Structure Lab, um, uh, we have been working with Martin Saxe um, as a visiting scientist. He uh, still he's now in the Instituto de Salud Carlos III and he uh, keeps participating in our projects. Isabel Fernández de Castro, Raquel Tenorio, Beatriz Pacheco, Moises García, Paulo Ortega and Alberto Fernández have been working very intensely in these projects of antivirals, and Sara Yolanda Fernández, who is our technician. Our collaborators, Jose Pedro Cerón Carrasco, expert in chem computational chemistry, and Nuria Izquierdo Uceros and team, uh, we do all the work with uh, SARS-CoV-2 in their lab uh, at the UC Caixa in Barcelona. About funding, very important because the uh, different agencies uh, support our work, in particular the Ministry of Science and Innovation of Spain. The crowdfunding coming from the uh, Spanish Foundation of Science and Technology and the National Institutes of Health uh, in the United States. And this is all. Thanks a lot for your attention and I will be happy to answer to any questions.